15 now, and we should be starting on our somewhat free format conversation with Smari McCarthy on whether it's too late to be pessimistic about climate change. Uh, Smari McCarthy has a bit of a uh, colored past, uh, but his last gig was being a member of the Icelandic Parliament for the, Ic uh, for the Icelandic Pirate Party. But I'm sure Smari can extend this introduction further. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, I was actually told that I was supposed to give you an optimistic talk about climate change. Um, and the, there was this question of, okay, first off, how does one do that? But secondly, uh, is that the talk I would necessarily give? And after thinking about it a little bit, I'm like, you know, yeah, no, I, I think I can actually be fairly optimistic about climate change. Um, but uh, before we can get optimistic, we need to really div uh, dive down into the pessimism and really understand how bleak this can get. Uh, but then we'll work our way up from there. Um, well, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to give you li like a little bit of an intro, and then hopefully we can turn this into a bit of a conversation. So, um, um, so just like, how do I end up doing this? Uh, well, while I was in the Icelandic Parliament, I was uh, uh, in part uh, taking care of uh, climate policy for my party, and we were, um, you know, always trying to figure out how we could improve things. And I started asking these really annoying questions, like, okay, hi, we're spending all this money, like all these governments all around the world are spending all this money on trying to fix climate change. Why are we not fixing climate change yet? What's the problem? Why is this hard? And the deeper I got down into this question, and you know, I, I talked to people in the ministries, I talked to people in uh, business, academia, I went all the way to like the deputy uh, secretary general of the UN, and you know, just asking everybody I could find, like, how how come we're not fixing this? And one of the things that um, became clear is we don't really know how yet. So, let's start here. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from a book called uh, Uninhabitable Earth. It's by David Wallace Wells. Uh, some of you might have read it. It's actually, I'm going to take two quotes and splice them together. But he says, uh, At two degrees, the ice sheets will begin their collapse. 400 million more people will suffer from water scarcity. Major cities in the equatorial band of the planet will become unlivable. And even in northern latitudes, heat waves will kill thousands each summer. Then he goes on to say, The upper end of the probability curve put forward by the United Nations to estimate the end of the century high emission scenario put us at 8 degrees warming. Warming of that level would require a suicidal cocktail of sadistic policy, public indifference, and catastrophic luck. At 8 degrees, humans at the equator and in the tropics would not be able to move around without dying. Hardly any land on the planet would be capable of efficiently producing any of the food we now eat. Forests would be roiled by rolling storms of fire and coasts would be punished by more and more intense hurricanes. Okay, so that's the 8 degree warming scenario and the 2 degree warming scenario. So I think we can relatively safely say that the 1.5 degree warming scenario that ship has sailed, right? So, on on the 1.5 degree warming, th this is a virtual inevitability. We might m possibly be able to back uh, back out from that one, but it seems very unlikely. We're all already most of the way there, and this is just our reality now, right? The uh, the average temperature on Earth was 15 degrees Celsius when we started this mess. Now it's going to be about 16.5. That's if we manage to stop everything now. Uh, the 8 degree scenario is where life is really absolutely fucked, okay? And uh, not just absolutely, but comprehensively fucked. Um, but here's the good news. He, he said, a suicidal cocktail of sadistic policy, public indifference, and catastrophic luck would be required in order for this situation to manifest, right? So, okay, we probably can't control luck much, but let's come back to that one. But 
policy and indifference are entirely controllable, right? And uh, some people are currently indifferent, and uh, there seems to be a bit of a, uh, shall we say, political uh, alignment on, on that topic. Uh, so, as uh, so, more right-wing people are more likely to be indifferent. Uh, more left-wing people are more likely to be outraged. Uh, but in general, neither is actually helping much to fix the problem at the moment. So, you know, let's let's try and address this in a like useful way. Um, and actually, a useful way to think about this is to not confuse indifference with a lack of agency. Because there are certainly people who are indifferent, but I think there's a lot more people who are really scared or at least somewhat concerned who would like to fix this problem, but don't know how. Much like all of these people I was uh, talking to about this stuff in, in various governments and, and whatnot. So um, if we are talking about like the m literal millions of people in the world who would like to do something, it, it might be hundreds of millions or whatever, um, what they have in common is they don't necessarily know what exactly to do, they are uncertain what helps, um, they are somehow being inefficient with the uh, money and resources and capabilities that they do have, and you know, those are actually sufficient. So this is one of those things where like, we shouldn't attribute to malice where uh, ignorance will suffice. But this isn't willful ignorance. This is just, we don't really know how this stuff works yet. And broadly, uh, you know, and this is uh, harkening back to what I was saying at my talk yes yesterday, uh, whenever it was. Um, yeah, uh, I've, lost, uh, I've lost count. Um, but uh, so the, the issue is not as simple as just r reducing the emissions of CO2 and capturing more CO2. It's also this much more complex thing of dealing with uh, processes such as desertification and eutrophication of uh, lakes and rivers. Uh, those are much more complex chemical processes and we can't just reduce it to a single number. And uh, I have this um, just strong complaint about so using CO2 as the metric it is a CO2 amount in the atmosphere is a really good metric for the scale of the problem, but it is not a good metric for the scale of the solution. If we are only measuring the solutions by how well they remove CO2 from the atmosphere, then we're going to be missing things such as uh, ecosystem failure, uh, you know, uh, mass extinction events, uh, things like that, uh, and not to mention desertification. Uh, um, that are actually very problematic. Quick question to interject. Isn't the scale of the solution not equally important as the complexity of the solution? Yes. Okay, so if you want to talk about scale, um, so, yeah, sure, uh, but okay, so desertification globally, it's about 120,000 square kilometers per year. Uh, that's about uh, just a, m just slightly more land than Iceland. It's also about three Belgiums. Uh, we're running out of Belgiums. Uh, is uh, what? One Switzerland. One Switzerland. Yeah, that's a good metric, and it's also going to annoy the Swiss. So I like it. Um, but um, so that desertification isn't coming from one source. It isn't just the heating. Um, the vast majority of it is due to uh, overgrazing or an agricultural uh, overextraction of nitrogen and nutrients. So there's a thing where, like, you can actually catalog the uh, the causes, and about half of them are social, and the other half are um, somehow need an engineering solution. And as far as I can tell, nobody's really working on the engineering side of things on a large scale. Uh, everybody's working. Everybody who's working in this field is working on trying to teach farmers and other experts to be better at uh, at doing their uh, their thing. So uh, the two big uh, anti-desertification projects that are that are on, kind of ongoing. Uh, one is in China. The other is uh, uh, the Great Green Wall project in Africa. Um, that one's hardly started. The Chinese one is actually going pretty well. So that's great. Um, and the, um, but the biggest success story that I can point out is that um, 
in, 19, in the 1950s, Iceland was a complete wasteland, and now it's only partially a wasteland. So, you know, we've made progress. But um, if I just quickly go back to the policy side of things, um, and yeah, so, so I, I'll, I maintain that people generally want to help. People want to fix this. The fact that we're all here is evidence of that. And the fact that there's events like Extinction Rebellion and whatnot, you know, uh, organizations you know, of all sorts, is evidence of that. And if you talk to politicians, even they are kind of like, yeah, no, we need to do something. Their failing is more that they don't know exactly what to do. So bad policy, which would be one element of our uh, cocktail, uh, bad policy comes from lack of understanding, it comes from insufficient or incorrect information. It comes from conflicting priorities and often traditionalist arguments and then sometimes political bad faith. Now, having worked in politics for a few years, I can tell you political bad faith is nowhere near as common as we would like to believe. It's so easy to say, oh, that guy is an asshole. And everything he says is just like, he's just uh, shilling for the something or other. And sure, there are people who are like that, but most of them are not. And it's super helpful for any conversation to assume some good faith. And, and uh, especially, again, here, ignorance and uh, insufficient and incorrect information is sufficient to explain it. Another question here. How does identity politics figure in this equation for you? <laughs> now you're just trying to uh, take us off track. <laughs> um, identity politics is largely getting in the way of solutions. Uh, so one of the things that uh, that has been happening, I'm not saying that identity politics is always bad, but it uh, there is an element of it which causes people to um, to kind of uh, heighten the otherness of, of their adversaries. And especially when we're talking about like the political right. Um, so, uh, for instance, there was a colleague of mine in the in the Icelandic Parliament uh, from a far right wing party, um, you know. And generally, I didn't really like agree with him on a lot of things. But when he left pol politics, he went to work for the UN Convention on uh, Desertification, uh, combating desertification, because you know he actually felt, felt that that was an important thing. So, you know, there, there's some good there, even in, in the far-right people. But you, you have a... Yeah, I would like to... Yeah. Uh, question on the on, on, on policy. Uh, I mean, there's many emerging economies uh, which will, which will uh, manifest themselves in the upcoming years. Yeah. Uh, their needs are probably more focused on, you know, yeah, le leveling the playing field, getting uh, getting up there, being competitive in in the world market. Do you consider that not uh, a hazard to right. yeah to to uh, also combating uh, climate change? Yes. Uh, absolutely. So uh, this is where where I mentioned com uh, conflicting priorities. So uh, when you hear of China uh, saying, "Oh, we're going to have to spin up this many coal plants just to keep up with our energy production needs." You know, yes, that's terrible and it's terrifying and it's really counterproductive. But at the same time, uh, like, uh, you know, and I, I'm no fan of Chinese uh, policy, neither nationally or internationally or whatever, uh, but they are actually a country that has uh, defined very clear goals and very ambitious goals with regards to uh, carbon reduction. So, like, there's one of those things where, yes, what they're doing, the, you know, more power, power plants is actually bad but at least they are explaining why they're doing it and what their plan is to stop doing it. And so uh, there, there's something where one of the things that we can do is ho uh, hopefully help develop better technologies, more technologies that can make the transition faster and easier. Um, so China at the moment, just one moment, uh, China at the moment is, uh, has the um, uh, largest amount of 
uh, solar panels in the world. Like, so they're doing the best on that front, while, you know, but we're giving them a hard time because they have a growing middle class who want to have electricity in their homes. You know, like, I think we should try to find, find ways of being helpful there rather than necessarily always being in the attack mode. The other thing I'll say on that before I hand the mic to Walter is, um, in international trade, my favorite quote of all time uh, comes from uh, the Indian negotiator at the uh, original GATT uh, agreement, um, where they were talking about whether there should be preferential treatment for developing countries. And this guy said, um, let me get this right because it's, it's so nicely worded. Um, equity is, no, uh, equality is equitable only among equals, right? Equality is equitable only among equals. Um, so treating all countries uh, the same way and holding everybody to the same standard is going to be very evil and counterproductive. And when we're looking at countries like China and uh, India in particular that have a long way to go in terms of energy production uh, capacity and just bringing their middle class up to a better wealth and life standard, let's also bear in mind that like the closest thing to we've had uh, recently to a uh, serious mass death event due to a uh, wet bulb temperature hitting 31 degrees Celsius, uh, where it become, the air basically becomes unsurvivable. It's a, it's a sauna where you, people just die. That was in Tamil Nadu about a month ago in, in India. They hit 29.7 degrees. So like Indians understand the need to fix this. So let's let's try to be nice and give them a break, but try and help everybody along the way. Because it turns out we all share one atmosphere, and you know we definitely need to make progress. But let's let's try to uh, be equitable, not just equal. Um, yeah. And to follow up, isn't there an opportunity to just leapfrog fossil fuels for especially for Africa by going straight to solar PV? Yes, and this is kind of where I wanted to turn this into a conversation. So, um, what I, you know, what I started with was this quote from David Wallace Wells and and his definition of uh, the. Um, let me find that wording again. Um, the suicidal cocktail of sadistic policy, public indifference, and catastrophic luck. Okay, now um, uh, just to like say regarding luck, luck is actually just uh, what we call a failure to understand statistics, right? Uh, if we understand statistics, there is no luck anymore. There's just uh, playing the game correctly, right? So I'd say let's turn this into a bit of a conversation about things like leapfrogging, um, you know, uh, the, the petrochemicals, uh, about all of these different technologies and all these different methods that would help, but focus on how do we reduce public indifference how do we avoid sadistic policy, and how do we um, uh, improve our understanding so that we don't have to rely on on um, not having catastrophically bad luck, right? Does that sound like a good plan? And uh, if we do this correctly, the the way that the outcome of this uh, comes uh, is, I'd like it if we could take some notes. I don't know exactly how we can do that yet. Um, I mean, we could use this, I suppose, but um, but. Uh, but what? Uh, you know, so the ask here is: Let's not just be techno optimists on here, because let's also look at the po uh, politics and the reality, the real politics of people having different constraints, different needs, different um, the, the competing interests. And let's try to be humane about it, because like, look, we're all going to suffer if we fuck this one up. So. Maybe we can, like, in a nice, friendly way, come up with a set of good policies, good technologies, and uh, and so on that don't assume that everybody's going to be a like um, a, 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 you know a, a bike riding vegan uh, hug the gay whales type of person. Like that would be great, but we're not going to get everybody in the world to do that. So yeah, all right. Question. Um, like CO2 reduction is, is important, but I think the, the CO2 we emit today affects the climate in like 10 or 20 years from now. So, so what we are suffering right now is from CO2 of the past. Yeah. So how can you, um, like CO2 reduction right now won't necessarily 
prevent climate change on this moment because it's already emitted. So how um. would we, yeah, is it necessary to reduce CO2 to avoid climate change in, in the future? Yeah, so... Okay, so the the thermal buffers of the planet, like the atmosphere, um, so yeah, and the oceans. The ocean is the much bigger buffer, but it's also much slower moving. Um, uh, so they they store uh, heat, but uh, the the CO two in the atmosphere now, yes, it's it's old CO two that's um, that's causing the problem now, but it's because it's been accumulating over time. So uh, making quick movements now can actually uh, fix things relatively quickly. We don't actually understand how quickly, but um, so I, I'm not sh super super concerned about that. But yeah, so okay, uh, we got indifference. We got uh, ah sadistic policy, and we got. Um, Bad luck. Catastrophic luck. Okay, so your task. Let's fill these in with uh, ways of flipping these in our favor, right? For all humanity. Anybody want to start? Uh, catastrophic luck. Bad luck. Very bad luck. So for indifference, I'm thinking that people should bear the consequences of their own behavior. In some kind of way, there should be like a feedback loop. Like, um, carbon in the air. But, uh, the time gets hot, they will take a holiday. So, uh, so, yeah. So, in uh, using uh, economic incentives or regulatory incentives. Oh yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Good things. Like right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Punishment doesn't really work. But uh, but there is maybe uh, tracking externalities. Like, uh, you know, if we, um, uh, if we look at, like, um, you know, deforestation on a large scale, a lot of uh, the reason deforestation and, like, t you know, certain other industries work is because the industries themselves are not made to pay for the externalities. The oil industry is uh, the most massively subsidized industry in the world, and that's not even counting the externalities, right? So, uh, so externality... Yeah. Yeah. In internal, yeah. Yeah. I was saying. So to counter indifference, one of the things you can do is internalizing the costs that are now external to. Yeah. So that you're actually paying for uh, the footprint of the things you're using, right? Yeah. And then also includes the lesser known uh, parts of this cost, like logistics and storing stuff, and on the get get the whole chain of the product you're, that you're using, get it incorporated in this CO2 tax. Yeah, so there's uh, uh, work there being done on like uh, tracking you know smart uh, smart logistics chains that kind of thing. So yeah, um, I, I put external internalized externalities under policy because it sounds. Uh, Less of an issue about public indifference and more about like making sure that the rules are good. Yeah, can we just actually uh, define indifference? Because I think taxes and punishments, as we want to call them, yes, work on, say, companies. Mm -hmm. But taxes on individuals to combat indifference is regressive. So incentives on individuals, as in us, mm -hmm. are not. So I want to I wanted define what we're talking about when we talk about indifference. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, and uh, and I think in some ways this is kind of the PR aspect. Like, you know, it's. Uh, so let's imagine. Um, so we're not talking about big polluters here. We're talking about the public. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can we, can we shoot one rule? <coughs> Makes it easier if it just takes to the person with the microphone talks. <laughs> sure. 
Yeah. Okay. So um, let's let's take like I, I I want to make a caricature here for a moment. Like uh, you know, imagine imagine the person who has uh, who is least concerned about climate change of all people, right? Uh, now, uh, I, I think you all have roughly the same I idea of uh, it's going to be a white man, probably in his uh, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, 80s, yeah? Um, uh, he's going to be, you know, reasonably, not necessarily wealthy, but uh, sufficiently well off, right? Uh, he's going to live in the West, he's going to uh, possibly live in a rural area, and um, his indifference, where does it stem from? It doesn't affect him. That's yeah. Okay. But um, so, if if it doesn't affect him, so he doesn't care. How do we make that person care? Like, I'm not saying force him to care, but like figure out a way to assist that person in caring. And uh, so, I I actually occasionally talk to people like this, and uh, what I find is that they don't. They it's not even that they. Uh, don't uh, care per se. It's that they just don't believe that it's actually a problem. And you know, uh, like I, I heard this guy saying, like, um, yeah, you know, what, uh, even if this is real, what's Greta Thunberg going to do about it? And it's like, come on, you know, this is a adult guy. You know, he's supposed to know better than you know. But he really uh, simplified it down to this level. And I'm like, no, no, look, they're climate scientists. They actually know what they're doing. Um, you know, this is real. We've measured it. Why don't you care? And so what, what kind of incentives would work on that kind of person? You, do you want to? Um, also, I don't think this, uh, I don't see where the basis that the idea that penalizing even regular people, I mean, obviously, if we, you know, quintuple the, co the price of meat, uh, this isn't really going to affect people's, like, it's going to change the cost of that. You know, if we can quintuple the cost of gasoline, it will have a slightly more impact, but it will ultimately end up beneficial. That's an argument that comes from privilege. People need to be able to eat and drive themselves around and do all kinds of things. Punishing people for those, for living their lives, especially if they're poor, I think is extremely regressive. But I specifically singled out meat. Yeah, but... Uh, you said meat. meat. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, should we talk about food for a moment? Okay. So, global food production. So, it's about 5.4 billion tons of meat. It's about uh, 6.3 billion tons of vegetables a year. A few hundred million tons of fish. Um, you know, and and then what? Like. Uh, which part of the food system can we can we actually optimize? And again, let's take it through, through this. Uh, do we have sadistic policy that's making uh, making our food systems worse? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So what what do we do here? Okay. Stop. So okay. We could do that. Um, but could we maybe uh, also think about the way in which um, monocultures are extracting nitrogen from soil in in unsustainable ways? Uh, how reliance on, on um, uh, industrial fertilizers are causing uh, the, the microbiomes in the soil to basically not produce, uh, not bind nitrogen, right? So I think uh, just not subsidizing, uh, stopping subsidizing the meat industry alone is insufficient. It's probably part of the answer, but what's a big answer? Well, I, I think we have also to... Uh, um, the, the the food for the animals is also a big problem because uh, the, uh, uh, lots of times uh, the rainforests are cut uh, because uh, they have to uh, to build that uh, that kind of uh, food uh, monocultures uh, somewhere in uh, uh, Southern America or, or somewhere and um, so uh, I think uh, probably we, we should uh, forbid to import that kind of stuff if it's uh, if it's a very uh, um, uh, if it's produced in a way that um, that's very very bad for the for the climate and for for the nature. Yeah. Uh, we'll do this. So we'll, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I I think 
um, just uh, even without addressing like the meat industry and pointing the finger there, uh, putting stuff local and making sure that food for animals is produced locally. You have a closed le loop, especially also in the Netherlands, we have this nitrogen uh, problem, which is exactly this problem. It's uh, nitrogen that is harvested in uh, Brazil is brought over uh, here and is added to the system and then you you have an excess and then instead of using that fertilizer you use uh, artificial fertilizer for growing the crops that you'll eat so if you make any kind of like um, uh, farming uh, for animals also land bound and say that the, the loops have, have to be closed, the, the, the cycle has to be closed uh, locally, that is already a big improve, a systemic improvement, uh, apart from the fact that you need to scale down uh, a lot of these uh, things, so. Yeah, um, I think the big issue here is, as you mentioned, monoculture crop growing, but I don't think the solution is involved in making sure that the monoculture uh, the, the crops grown for animal feed are by definition going to be cheap and the same and ubiquitous. So you're not going to solve that problem by just making it locally instead of in other places and shipping it. Uh, so the, the policy would need to be specified towards ensuring that more varied and diverse crops are grown in fields, which is by definition not a simple um, policy to make. Yeah, so uh, just to note, uh, we're using these uh, microphones as indicators of who can talk, partially because we're uh, using them to record for the stream, but uh, when uh, it's not amplified in here, so speak up if you're uh, talking. Um, just to add to that point, um, the so there are definitely... Uh, one of the reasons we seem to be doing monocultures on a large scale is because all of the... Um, so after the Green Revolution, we've had uh, much better access to industrial fertilizers and been able to scale up those processes and hyper-optimize them. But now we're realizing that that was a local optimization. It was like an optimization trap. And maybe, you know, now people are talking about uh, things like uh, re um, regenerative agriculture which is fantastic, but we don't know how to scale that up yet. So if anybody's got ideas. Yeah, so the monoculture, when I think of that, I also think of Monsanto, who grow uh, seeds and uh, uh, pesticides which only work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of uh, regulation to protect their intellectual property. Yep. There's different ways of uh, growing seeds. I think the Netherlands is, a, is an example of that, but I'm not too keen on the details where you can use each other's uh, seeds to create new seeds again and there's a, like it's an open source model on, on seed creation and I think we could use more of that too yeah. because I think monocultures are due to companies like Monsanto. Also fertilizers take about 2% of the global energy use. Um, I think it's probably best to have the system uh, monetize the, the guys that do the good things and create a policy on that. Um, so if you could do uh, like a permit culture, a uh, food garden, and you grow things there, you sell it from there, then you get subsidized. And if you do it in a less good way, in a, in a greenhouse, large greenhouse with uh, heated uh, with uh, uh, Russian gas and using industrial fertilizers, then these also vegetables should be more expensive, more expensive than the, than the well-grown ones. And that's a discussion all separately from the meat, but only the vegetables. But yeah, I think that's a way to um, incentivize uh, people to, to buy the good stuff. But it doesn't answer the question of scaling up. Right, yeah, th this is actually a really important point that Walter brings up. Uh, yeah. But uh, so specifically, one of the things all of us rely on, whether we are happy to admit it or not, is um, like, we're getting foods on a regular basis. Like I live in Iceland. Like if if I were only eating local food there, it would become very monotonous. There would be no, no avocados. There would be very few berries. There would be you know like it would it would not be a a fun time. Um, 
so much of the food that we eat is uh, reliant on global supply chains. So I think the next thing we should go to is uh, transportation uh, because you know I, I do like this uh, talk about the food system, but the other part of the, the other side of the food system is uh, the distribution channels. Uh, and on that, uh, like uh, you know, we we have shipping, we have uh, cargo freight on on uh, tr uh, trains and such. We have aviation. Um, uh, you know, uh, that always becomes a hot topic, but, um, but yeah, anybody else on the agriculture? Yeah, could, yes. yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, recently there was a report of a long-term study on uh, agriculture and especially fertilizer use and uh, mixing some of the kind of things we know from permaculture like uh, 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 nitrogen binding uh, crops uh, uh, cycling over fields together with using uh, uh, manure and uh, also mixing with uh, 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 artificial fertilizers. And the effect was actually that this uh, improved uh, harvest uh, from the current uh, mainstream big models. So there are definitely, at least in some transition, uh, hybrid models possible that have a higher or similar yield to uh, what we now would call traditional uh, 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 agriculture. So there definitely is uh, promising <coughs> research in that respect. What what uh, what is very important, I think, is that the uh, farmers get uh, get get a fair price uh, for the products uh, because uh, then they they also are uh, capable to uh, to invest in new technologies and uh, to uh, before it with the greenhouses to to use the warmth from the summer and and, and store it in earth and uh, get it back in the winter, for example. So. But now that it's not it's not possible that they are really uh, getting much too low uh, uh, price for the products. Okay, so make make food more expensive. I <laughs> yeah, I, I mean I don't disagree, uh, but uh, uh, this you know, and this is a balancing act. No, no, no. Maybe, maybe remove supermarket make, uh, make the supermarket. Yeah. Uh, okay, we can figure that one out. Uh, there's a few like there's I think. Two more, and then trans trans transport will be a yeah. good topic to I just think uh, it raises an interesting point that was raised earlier that I think is central to the whole discussion, which is the fact that there needs to be a massive price adjustment, a, a massive um, negative externality price adjustment happen for this whole thing to work. However, if we were to, as you say, make the farmers earn the correct amount for the crops if we were to stop subsidizing the oil industry and stop subsidizing um, other industries then people would have to start paying a lot more for things that they're used to not paying as much for which would increase in inequality quite significantly i believe so in in the department of statistic policies i think there needs to be some way of making the um, negative externalities that are currently not being paid for to be not paid for equally by everyone. That is, the poorest percentage of people do not need to pay the same amount for gas or other things, such as those that have higher income, or everybody pays the same amount, but the money used from these raised taxes is used to subsidize the existence of those that cannot afford to live otherwise, because we cannot simply eradicate the poorest part of the world and then expect to go on. I mean, that's not the way to be. Isn't me? Well, um, I actually just wanted to mention a couple of good projects that I've heard of that are doing really cool development on uh, helping farmers track the pi price throughout the entire supply chain, and specifically on luxury crops like vetiver. So food is one thing, right? We all need to eat food, but a luxury crop like vetiver that makes perfume, like that's a really amazing one to track through and incentivize the farmers to keep the vetiver in the ground for longer because it's become a cash, pro cash crop, so they pull it out of the ground. Incentivizing them to keep it in the ground for longer increases the quality of the vetiver, which also increases the price of a luxury product overall. Um, but there's also certain like incentives and benefits to the soil as well. So this is a Haiti, Haitian project that's doing really well. So there are projects out there that are doing really cool stuff about helping farmers track the price. Just thought I'd kind of, a little bit of good news out there. 
Yeah, no, that's actually a good point. Uh, the the goal of the session was to be hopeful and, and positive, and I think we ha are generally going in that direction. But I, you know, um, so projects like that are exactly the right kind of thing. I definitely want to hear about a lot of them, uh, but uh, I, I think this framing is about like not just how do we hope blindly, but how do we generate hopeful scenarios, right? So, did you? Uh, one of you had a. <coughs> Um, well, actually, uh, it ties in a bit with uh, what was said before. Um, the um, pay the farmers better is is kind of a, a good idea, but the reason why farmers are not feeling paid well is because of the entire financial structure yeah. around the industry, right? Uh, which is essentially driven by pure profit motives, profit for the profit. And I think as long as that is a driving factor of our food system, or many other things as well probably, that's never going to really get solved, I think. And then I'm going to jump in and kind of jump out of my role as facilitator. As soon as you talk about profit for the people, not profit for profit, you end up having identity politics. And roughly half of society will just tune out and say, fuck off, hippie. And, and yes, and, and that is not helpful on the indifferent side of the equation. Hold on, I'm not uh, against profit uh, as uh, a principle, uh, but profit for the profit as a... I mean, without, without any other... Basically, food production should... The goal of food production should be food production, not making a profit. Making a profit is a means to assure that food production. So, uh, so I, I'm loving how excited people are <laughs> about things. Um, uh, one point on this, and then I'd like to move on to like transportation uh, side of things a little bit. Uh, but uh, I put in land reform here, and uh, so uh, have any of you read a book called uh, How Asia Works? Okay, it's uh, it's very good. And one of the things that they point out there is um, that if you look at the um, successful economies in Asia, they, uh, one of the things that unites them is that they all went through a massive land reform after World War II. And what that did was it um, uh, caused farmers and, uh, to generally have much less land, and that led to them being way more productive on the land, right? And so um, maybe you know, land reform, and I mean this in the context of, of agriculture, but also uh, how we treat urban environments, how we, uh, how we organize land in general, might be one of the things. And of course, as a um, you know, recovering anarchist, I, uh, I feel the need to point out that uh, land is one of the, grand, uh, the great monopolies that we need to be countering. So, um, but yeah, urban uh, stuff uh, and transportation. Uh, transportation is exactly easy. Yes. Okay. 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 So we talked about uh, local production. Uh, I'm from the Fab Lab community. I believe also in uh, global design. And so uh, if we are uh, setting up the sessions that we have here and we maybe have some politicians or a country uh, that is open to experiment, I would, uh, I would suggest uh, global design and local production. Okay, so yeah, uh, this is the old Fab Lab mantra of uh, uh, design locally, emerge globally. Uh, and so uh, I helped work on, well, I uh, got the first Fab Labs in Iceland started and, uh, and yeah, and uh, managed to make the uh, make it a, a policy in Iceland that every secondary school should have a Fab Lab associated with it. That was part of what my party was doing. So this is right. I would like to go more into global design, but you have a Point. Yeah, I was going to say hopeful things about transport, but now we're derailing into this conversation. No, no bring it. Um, now, I, I first want to respond to that remark. Uh, Fab Labs are fantastic for prototyping stuff. For anything that is at prices we've grown used to, uh, we have to go back and look at Henry Ford. Well, Henry Ford was not even the inventor of mass production, but he was the first to do it for, uh, let's say, high-end consumer good like a car. That is something Fab Labs cannot do. For mass production, you still need two parts of your equation is, and that is you have your, um, uh, y y you, ha you have certain raw materials that you can only produce at scale. You cannot have a steel mill in your Fab Lab if you want to use steel to produce anything, uh, or a paper mill, 
or um, a, a you could have a fab lab in a paper mill, but the paper mill itself is already an industrial scale operation uh, at scale, and, and you want to do forestry at scale as well. Um, too much in the weeds, but yeah. Say again? You're, uh, you're going on for too long. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll you're talking too much. I, I'll, I'll, I'll fear, uh, you have been waiting for this literally 11 years to tell me. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the other bit I want to fear back to, um, transport, except aviation, and aviation is roughly 2.5% of carbon emissions. So as much as I hate bloody Schiphol and everything <laughs> related to that, it is not our biggest problem. Shipping, uh, especially long distance shipping, is nasty with bunker oil once you switch to LNG and there are other options. Wind could easily be recast in a relatively easily, it's a f but it's more of an engineering problem than a fundamental, and it has to do with certain incentives in the shipping industry that's not happened yet. But the current supply chains that reach into East Asia and back can be made carbon neutral without changing drastically. The last mile shipping can be electrified. The only hard nut, really hard nut to crack would be aviation, but like I said, aviation is in terms of transport more of a footnote than a major issue. Mm -hmm. So, and th that's actually good news because the more you have to change in your supply chains, in the way you work, the more resistance you will encounter. Uh, yeah, I, I would add to that that, um, you know, people like to complain about the aviation industry because everybody sees the planes in the sky and it's very strongly connected with ideas about like, um, you know, uh, luxury and yeah but uh it is yeah around two percent to uh, either side of the two percent mark uh, and the aviation industry because they're always under this kind of criticism and scrutiny are actually trying to improve themselves so i i will kind of defend them a little bit not just because i like flying uh but um but you know i hate flying and yeah. i will still say it's relatively yeah. speaking a footnote but the uh, that said you know, I like it when we do when we're hard on people like in that way. And like uh, you know, Ella's talk yesterday, uh, where she's just like trashing, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. It's like you know, even if I don't necessarily th fully agree, we need to apply that pressure, right? So um, on that note, um, so I, I uh, went to visit Ulsan uh, in Korea a couple of years ago. And there I visited the largest car factory in the world, which uh, spits out one new car every three seconds. Uh, and uh, next door to it is the largest fish, uh, the ship factory in the world. And there uh, I was visiting, amongst others, with, uh, with a guy who's the head of a very large international shipping corporation. Uh, and they were laying up, uh, I think it was like 14, 15 new ships, cargo ships, each of which was supposed to take 13,000 co container units. And I asked the guy, have you considered powering them by nuclear instead of diesel? And he was like, no, why would we do that? So how do we address this kind of indifference? I mean, you know, and we've been very much on the policy side. I think there might be a, like, a slight rules-oriented uh, thing here. But, like, how do we make people who are at the top of the shipping industry go, like, hey, maybe we ought to decarbonize our shipping fleet? Maybe internalize the cost of... Uh uh, of, of of carbon energy into 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 the energy price. So uh, it it uh, eventually all comes down to internalizing cost, yeah. and it needs to be f uh, put in, into financial in what what re what reaches people, which is their finances. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we do have um, there's an international agreement. Thanks uh, about. Um, uh, so using crude oil on ships in international waters. So that's been progress. Uh, th th that's now not allowed. Um, whether people are actually enforcing it, that's another question. But um, but that is one step towards internalizing those. But uh, so so just a, a few random facts. Not not really uh, anything useful. So there is actually one nuclear powered shipping vessel operating. The Soviet Russia has one. But it doesn't. Um, it's generally it's not allowed to go into port, so it has to have this design where it can carry these light. They call them lighters, 
they're, they're they're smaller ships that that can then it can lower and they're basically barges and somebody tows them into port but there's a bunch of legal complexities around that so that is solving that problem of having the shipping ship that doesn't actually go into the port and having that be a reasonable thing for people to do is how you would is the main thing to get the nuclear working the other problem is is that the the shipping companies actually these giant container ships they don't build them to last that long um, and if I, the reactors, like at least the military reactor, like the reactors that the U.S. military uses, might last longer than the these ships. I'm not sure. So, uh, it, it, it that, obviously that should be fixed too. But that's just a, these are just two two. Okay. Thanks. Um, your question about um, how do we, you know, encourage <clears throat> the shipping guy to think differently. Uh, I know a few of you here have heard me have these like signal rants in the morning um, and I don't have an answer and I'm curious to see if the room has an answer just about how we encourage more long-term thinking because I think there is a lot of short-term thinking both in terms of how we tackle climate change but just in everything right like gas prices and all of these things and we're not really encouraging long-term thinking to see seek those solutions um, and I don't know what the answer is I'm really curious if anybody does because it's a grand frustration of mine <laughs> One small thing, if you were, were interested in making the nuclear shipping thing work, who, uh, France, is, France is a very, has a nuclear industry that they really like, and maybe you should try and get, convince the French that they want to have a nationalized shipping fleet. Uh, so if our, if our solution to climate change is trust the French... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm joking. I'm, 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 the, the I'm French going to toss out a few random facts about nuclear shipping is stupid. Yes. Oh. First of yes. Oh, okay. First of course, of course, you need miniature reactors, and the smaller your reactor, the higher grade the fuel is, and it will basically be closer to the weapons grade. That's one of the reasons. Well, they have these lovely tiny nuclear reactors in submarines, but they're all military submarines. For nuclear proliferation purposes, the idea of having Liberian flagged container ships having uh, a submarine <laughs> in the great nuclear fuel on board. I am not looking forward but to that particular perspective. That's with traditional reactors, not like modern uh, ceramic, uh, uh, ceram uh, so pebble, pebble, pebble or, uh, pe or pebble salt. Pebble bed reactors are actually a bloody dead end because pebble bed reactors turn out to be worse than the previous generations. Oh, okay. They're really shite safety-wise because they make cause the graphite. The pebbles are made of graphite. And the temperature shrinks and expands, so they create graphite dust, ah. which is the least yeah, uh, okay. lovable yeah, substance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 But basically, long story short, uh, before I get to give it to Anke, no. Anke, nuclear is shite in general, and especially at small scale. I would say, look into the figures, for example, to kites. There's at least one Hamburg startup. Um, you can already replace at up to six megawatt using massive kites that are automatically steered. For the big container ships, you need about 30 uh, megawatt. Um, that's not a terrific big, terribly big jump to go that from to go for wind when, when you're really offshore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, nice. I, I agree with Walter. But we should uh, we should not uh, uh, run into uh, using other non-renewables. For shipping, we should go to uh, to renewable energy sources uh, like like wind or uh, even solar. Probably, I don't know uh, how, how good is uh, it is possible on, on ships. That that uh, probably has to be uh, researched. But I think uh, wind uh, will will certainly be uh, 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 possible. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I. I'm slightly more optimistic about nu nuclear, but uh, I, I do understand the drawbacks that are being mentioned. Um, but, yeah. I was, oh. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to suggest that rather than uh, the solution to, to the shipping problem is don't ship stuff. Yes. Build it, make it closer to where it's needed. As much as possible. Yeah. Okay. Like 3D printing. Yes, very good idea. <laughs> 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 in, in Iceland, then. Huh? No, I f no, I forget it was in Iceland. No, exactly. <laughs> and uh, the people aren't going to be happy with it. But maybe 3D printed uh, tomatoes one time. Uh, no, I'm I'm responding to something uh, I heard here. 
saying they're not made to last, and uh, that makes me think of planned obsolescence. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, companies, one. companies profit from constantly having renewed uh, consumer cycles, and that seems to be a very hard uh, issue to fix. Because how are you going to revamp the whole economic system in one go? It's it all it all entails many other systems, and uh, it's just world reform actually what you need. But I don't know how to solve it. If anyone has uh, has the slightest of ideas. Uh, I would love to hear. So, yeah, no, this is a really good point. And also, I, I, I discovered that I really rely on uh, autocorrect when I t uh, use, write the word obsolescence. So, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. But, um, uh, but uh, so one of the ways we deal with that is better, uh, stronger consumer uh, protection laws, uh, and in particular, warranties, right? Longer warranties basically uh, force uh, longer term. Uh, things, but um, but one of the things that always happens, and this is kind of like the trap function type thing, is if you are if the warranty is required to be three years, then all of the equipment, all of the things are going to be designed to last three months, uh, three years in one day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you'll be very skewed so they don't end up accidentally to you know breaking two years and uh, three and twelve uh, eleven months, right? Um, so the question is not just how do we lengthen warranties, and that's something that should be re relatively easy to advocate for on the European level. The uh, European Union loves messing around with consumer protection law. But um, uh, the other thing is, how do you disincentivize this you know, warranty length plus one day behavior? And that's m that kind of partially belongs in the indifference category, but... Yeah, and also, how do you how you do how you how do you foster reuse, repair, uh, recycle uh, kind of behavior? There's good news on that one. I mean, can, could this be done with some kind of like tax policy that essentially was meant to like drive recycling and other things? So essentially, after the pro after the product line, at some point, the EU some EU thing says okay. This product has has been EOL'd, we believe, roughly speaking, and so we're going to impose this tax, this tax on the manufacturer based on sort of how much was EOL'd when and blah blah blah. Is that at all sane? No. Uh, so actually, I I kind of like the, the the direction you're going in here. So the the good news was uh, around. Um, uh, right to repair in Europe. Uh, somebody here probably knows the details of this a lot better than I do, but uh, but the right to repair is actually making progress in a lot of places. Uh, so that's good. Uh, but regarding that idea, so in there's a lot of places that still do like uh, tax incentives for electric vehicles, but. Um, uh, one idea that's come up is is kind of flipping the script on that and say rather uh, let's pay people a higher amount of money to take old vehicles that pollute a lot out of the uh, out of uh, distribution like um, you know ba basically make there be fewer o bad vehicles on the road rather than paying for there to be more supposedly good ones right so how about we do that on a slightly bigger scale and just start to provide uh, tax incentives for uh, using equipment uh, for longer periods of time. Uh, so we want to get rid of the old clunker cars that are polluting a lot, um, but we probably want people to live in older houses because uh, the most uh, carbon efficient house is, is the one that's already built, right? Not necessarily, uh, not necessarily. okay. Yeah, okay. Actually, <laughs> concrete once poured. Yeah. <laughs> concrete once poured is a CO2 absorbent. The problem is the production of the cement beforehand. Yeah. My problem, my, the way, my skepsis, and I will get back to the remark just made before. My skepsis about the house already built is the most carbon. Uh, and it's, it's actually not true because, especially in the climates in, at these latitudes, you will burn so much fuel in heating the house that sometimes it's actually b better to demolish it and replace it with a new net zero house. Um, as a general remark about tax incentives and so forth, do realize when you make policy, it's always best to make, give tax incentives or, pen or penalized behavior at a, a central place as possible. 
So your supplier of your low quality plastic -y goods will probably at the European level not be the manufacturer but, but an importer. That's someone you can talk to, but by the time that plasticky, crappy product is at the end of life, the person holding it is a consumer, and the manufacturer will be sitting somewhere in Southeast Asia, because that's the world's workshop currently, and therefore is out of reach for your... So the moment you want to touch that supply, that life cycle of the product is at the point of importation into the European Union. Yeah, I have two comments, but I think the, the first one I have is, is still uh, about the discussions five minutes ago about transport, ships, etc. And the second one is about concrete. I think if you think about the learn long term, um, somebody told me that concrete using concrete is um, is yeah in in the beginning really really bad for the environment. But if you l use it more than 50 years, it's even better to use concrete than than wood or something else. No. Um, uh, wood is in many ways provided that it is, has been f forested in, in a sustainable way. Uh, so assuming sustainable forestry practices, wood is way better. Cement is really, really shite because um, it's actually worse than steel per ton in terms of CO2 emission. Um, but a lot of cement use could be replaced by wood. So, uh, uh, engineered, wood. engineered wood though. Uh, so more modern uh, 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 lumbers. Basically anything a few meters above ground level could easily even into a high rises. There's currently a 80 meter tall building in Nor Norway which is made out of engineered lumber. And we will probably see within the next decade uh, wood buildings raising uh, 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 higher than 100 meters. So for, uh, for normal buildings, for utility buildings, slightly different, or especially for civil works like viaducts and so on, uh, that is more out there, but for housing and um, office buildings, wood is a very interesting solution to, to construction materials. Maybe go have another idea. For all products that actually uh, are supplied with the energy label right now, maybe put on the energy label the expected life cycle of this product also oh yeah and then if you put this expected life cycle the, the customer knows what to expect and then also what the energy use or the co2 usage or whatever um, you can derive that from that and also maybe uh, include some warranty statements in that so we have that on light bulbs but it would be nice to have it on everything else right yep. so yeah uh, could oh, you on pass on cars on washing machines or yeah whatever. I think uh, we, we must uh, think about which products to reuse, which products to recycle, and which products just to break down. Uh, 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 for example, uh, furniture, if uh, some old people die or, or go to a nursery home or something and, and there, there is a lot of furniture, often very good, we, you, we can reuse that. That's no, uh, that, that's, that doesn't consume any, any energy and it's better to reuse this. But uh, if it's uh, electronic uh, uh, stuff, uh, probably it, uh, uh, the new, the new um, uh, thing would, would use much less energy. So um, it, it depends on, on the life cycle. You have to, to look at the, at the special um, uh, thing you, uh, you want to, to recycle or anything. But uh, um, for example, um, Mobile phones, it, it's catastrophic uh, how, how, how long uh, the life cycle is. Yeah. Um, uh, but but you, could, you, could, uh, you could recycle them, but you should use them for much longer. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, about houses, well, y you have also uh, new materials like uh, or, or very old materials, in fact, uh, straw and clay uh, to, bow, to, to build houses. So that that uh, seems to be very energy efficient as well. So we, we should uh, uh, use that uh, much more. I just wanted to say a really quick note about um, concrete and renewable materials. Like the type of sand that we use for concrete, we're rapidly running out of it. Um, and it's finite, so we can't kind of just grow it like we do with trees. So that's just another reason to kind of just throw that out there. So um, could you, so if instead of just labeling for life, life cycle, you could augment the VAT 
like you could have the vat increase with the shorter life cycle. And then it's hard um, to do. Okay. And then there's there's another thing. So it's very. I mean, phones are. I'm not sure that's that big of a problem. But if phones specifically, because you know, if they have a SIM card in them, you you could charge the you could make the carriers charge higher taxes if the yeah. phone is younger. So yeah, uh, I I think things like that are very difficult, and especially so one one thing I learned during my time in politics is uh, that. Um, tax authorities really, really hate it when you uh, mess with tax policy. Like, um, it's just complicated for them. And uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but we need to be very specific in how. Um, uh, one note, we've been going on for uh, slightly over an hour. Uh, uh, we, I think we have one more hour, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't necessarily want us to use the full extra hour just for shits and giggles. I think we need to be a little concrete. but. One thing is we've been very focused on the sadistic policy and actually how to make no less sadistic policy. Nobody has talked about how we improve our luck no, and very little about the indifference except for the incentives. I did actually uh, write the life cycle expectations into there. I think that's a really good way of powering uh, like consumer sentiment. Uh, and I wrote down conversations because conversations like this one are, I think, a massively good antidote to indifference. But they only they sometimes end up preaching to the choir a bit. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to comment a bit on the tax incentives because I think it's often overlooked, especially also by politicians, that well, every tax incentives and etc. Uh, uh, drives like is counterproductive in that uh, there's some kind of like pricing issue um, both because it's more complex but also basically for instance with uh, electric cars prices for electric cars in countries where their tax incentives are generally higher than in countries where there are no tax incentives because there's also a higher demand and etc and they can ask more so you actually what you're doing is subsidize you're not only uh, giving money to consumers, you're actually subsidizing uh, producers. And that could be okay, but you should at least be aware that this is what, hap uh, what happens if you do these kind of incentives. And then with other things like the kind of like incentives to do away with your very old polluting car, what we've seen in the Netherlands with uh, things like that that happened like years ago is that that also didn't really work out in terms of uh, uh, overall pollution and landfill and etc. So it is these are very complex things to steer in, and usually you'll have si economic uh, uh, side effects uh, that are not one to one related to what you're trying to steer. So usually other measures are preferable uh, before you get to that. Um, yeah. um, yeah, uh, also uh, we can stand up and just, uh, you know, if, if you want, but... Uh, I, I, I was first, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I would, in, as a matter of combating indifference, I would please, 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 please drop the bloody lingo of having to save the planet or the ecosystem or the lovely pandas. The fucking pandas need porno to reproduce. They're a Darwinistic failure. Fuck the pandas, <laughs> really. <laughs> this is, uh, and the whales and so on. It's not. It's uh, this is not selling well outside your own little circles, or maybe large circles. I don't care about the size of your circles. Uh, there is a massive circle that you need, or massive bunch of circles that have difficulties making meat ends meet at the end of the month, who have fuel poverty who will not be able to buy an electric car until second-hand electric cars will become affordable in another decade or so, um, none of these people will be convinced by a need to save the planet if they have difficulties to have both to pay their rent and their energy bill at the end of the month in February. It's about us, it's about humanity, it's about our children. Yes, I have a comment about luck. Okay, very good. Yes. Um, you mentioned before that we just don't know how to fix it, how to fix the problems, yeah. right? Because it's a macro issue that involves every possible system 
in our entire biosphere. And we need to understand that better so that we can plan accordingly, not just to make individual changes, to, but to make changes that will cascade in our benefit. Mm -hmm. So that's how we improve our luck. Right? Yep. We, we research, we plan multi-pronged attacks. When we, when we see an area is going to fall and it will not support civilization living there anymore, can we turn it into uh, green land that will continue to help us even as people move, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, I mean, we could even retitle these as uh, care more, make better decisions, and learn, yeah. right? So, um, and, and the learning is, is absolutely right. I mean, if, if there's one aspect that I'm trying to tackle in my work, it's really uh, reducing the catastrophic luck, uh, if anything. So, I, I, I do think I have a comment that uh, at least uh, maybe slightly long, longer term on the catastrophic luck side. Um, uh, so sort of, and uh, so I'm certainly not going to be defending pandas, uh, but the, um, um, but the, um, so all technology and all evolution is basically path dependent. You know, if you have something, you know, we, we can know how to do it. Every species that we exterminate, we learn, we're, we're losing, th we're losing knowledge. And, and this is going to impact what is possible for us in the future as a species. So at some point, it is better to, you know, if it's a choice between, you know, I mean, if it's, okay, we're going to lose a lot of people, but if it's a choice between, you know, you, at some point you don't, you do want to conserve some of these, a lot of these other species, you know, certainly biomes in the ground and bees and shit like this. Two things. Uh, I think we should flip them. <coughs> so it's, uh, what was the indifference one? Was it care more, learn, yeah. and then make better decisions. Yeah, agreed. Um, and then regarding the pandas and all that, there, it actually is just a really neat communications and behavioral psychology problem that has largely been solved um, around ownership uh, of a problem. So they've done this research with just like charities around like children uh, when we talk about our children rather than that, those children and their children, yeah. people are more likely to donate money. It's as seriously as simple as that. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit stuck on how we progress because I feel like we've covered a lot of ground already. I know a lot of you still have comments and I, I want to uh, try to get them, but um, what I'm thinking is, um, you know, this is a hope session and I think you know, what I set out to kind of try to uh, get to is like, okay, you know, the 1.5 degree, uh, uh, you know, uh, temperature raising situation, that ship has sailed, we might be able to get it back, but probably not. Um, there is this catastrophic 8 degree scenario, uh, how do we avoid that? And, you know, so our cocktail. Um, but um, what I'd like you know, uh, so let's continue the conversation, um, not ne necessarily for much longer, you know, let's maybe give it 20 minutes or so, but let's try to uh, also, like, if you've got any good examples of projects or, or initiatives or new laws, regulations, or anything like that, that's happening in your local area or something like that that you think other people should know about, this would be a great time to hear about it because, you know, uh, I feel like we're losing a little bit of momentum. We're getting a little bit into the weeds. And I, you know, I would love to, you know, have like 15 ideas to go and like search for on the internet when this is over, okay? So, um, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, just uh, also on uh, catastrophic luck. Um, I think it mostly also comes down to awareness because everyone has uh, their equal part to play. Yeah. Uh, it's about wholeness, it's about involving e everything, rethinking every system because it entails all these other systems. All these systems are interdependent and uh, I think we should uh, spend a lot of time on, on awareness and education and uh, with a particular uh, interest in systems thinking and uh, systems dynamics because, uh, yeah, they're all interwoven. Yeah, very good. Um, so actually I work for a paper mill in, uh, in Airbag 
Um, in Eerbeek we have uh, three paper mills um, uh, since 1661, uh, around that time. Uh, we also have our own uh, uh, water affluent plant. Um, and I, I, I find it, I work already for 15 years there, and I, it's only recently now that the gas prices are humongous that we are really getting in trouble and pressure is really on. Uh, but I find difficult and at the same time is maybe uh, hopeful in that sense. I, I want to refer back to the Fab Lab, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that what I lack is, is connected, connectedness. So we have this factory area in Eerbeek and uh, we, are, we are on our own almost, it feels like. Um, and, and, and yeah, so Holland is on its own as well, a very small country, only 25 paper mills. Uh, in Germany, you have over 300 paper mills, but it seems like everybody is working on its own. And I find that uh, very uh, depressing. And at the same time, I, I'm from the FabLab community. I know it's possible to start working together. And so, uh, how can we do that? That uh, is my question. Very good. So on that, um there's, I think, a lot about um, empowering people with information. I know that that's like a really popular thing to say right now, but um, I just want to talk about it quickly about a project that I know of in South Africa that is not climate related, but I think kind of plays into this a little bit. And it's um, townships. It turns out that um, in Cape Town, they have extremely good plat maps. Like they know where everything is, <laughs> which is surprising to some people. So what these people in townships have done is gone, hold on a second, we have access to these plat maps. We can understand what our towns are supposed to look like. And they've started to do lots of really amazing community building around like installing lights and schools and things. They're making their community safer. So it's a lot of that kind of like information gathering and information building and learning and then working with your community and whether that's really local within your town or your region or like whatever it is i think there's a way to build on to that so i think i think that's part of the answer if, if you're armed with information you can build community i have a thing that sort of excites me but that's on the other end of the scale because it's not very local or low scale uh, but basically currently every two three months, there's another uh, offshore floating wind concept being pushed out by the kind of industrial firms that can make that happen. So I fully expect us to, to that Europe may be able to be ahead of the curve on electricity generation just based on offshore wind. Uh, as in, uh, and what, what's interesting is this is stuff that is specifically designed to become mass produced. Um, specifically to be designed to be relatively low cost maintenance because offshore wind is more expensive than onshore wind because you have to helicopter in uh, uh, maintenance technicians uh, or bring in expensive ships to, to make them etc. This is all designed to be built in harbors uh, uh, brought into the ocean by tugboats and then connected to local grids for hydrogen electrolysis. This is all not there yet but uh, this is something that is pr pretty viable to happen if in the next decade. And I'll shut up a little. <laughs> Actually, one thing uh, just came to mind about uh, you know the optimistic side. Um, so th there's at events like this, we we have a slight tendency to be very, shall we say, suspicious of uh, like capitalistic tendencies and like you know that kind of thing, but. It, uh, it's interesting that like now we're in the middle of this like massive economic downturn, uh, pretty much hitting every country in the world. Pretty much like we're seeing double-digit inflation. It's like everything's pretty bad. One of the things that was happening back in like uh, October, November, December is that ba basically like every single week there was a new uh, venture capital fund established to fund climate tech research or climate uh, uh, climate technology of some kind or other. Um, there's so much money sloshing about in the system for developing technologies to help with climate change that like it's it's kind of almost obnoxious at the moment. Um, and one of the things that's really positive is now we're in this economic downturn and none of those funds has gone away. 
Um, the investment rate might have slowed down a little bit, uh, but the, the same amount of uh, money is still available. And so when I'm like thinking about the, the overall big picture of like how we're going to tackle this, there's definitely a tendency to go like, oh yeah, we're going to need a revolution and we're going to need to restructure everything and like, uh, but like humanity's been through a few hard places in the past, one or two maybe, and uh, like, yeah, sometimes we have fu fundamentally restructured our system, but often we've like just used systems that we already have in efficient ways and I think like uh, when, when it comes to the technologies that are emerging, you know, uh, we have uh, more and more carbon capture plants. I actually don't really believe much in the idea of like, like you know, if you are trying to caption, uh, capture carbon from the atmosphere, uh, you need to um, you're capturing about 300 grams per ton of processed air. I don't think that's very like you know um, scalable. But hey, you know, like uh, people are doing all sorts of cool stuff. Some of the projects are absolute bullshit. But like, there are such good projects in between that actually we're we're seeing progress. Uh, the other thing is, I mentioned earlier the um, the Great Green Wall project. Have all of you heard of that? It's um, so for a uh, few who didn't seem to be nodding. Uh, it's this idea that they're going to uh, like build like uh, so grow a, a world wonder, a, a a green belt right across the southern end of the Sahara. Uh, specifically to try and slow down the, uh, the uh, expansion of the Sahara Desert. Uh, now, deserts are problematic uh, in some ways. Some of them are natural. There's a natural desert I found out a few days ago in Poland. Uh, it's not very big, but like there's a desert in Poland. Yeah, you know, but um, and uh, Sahara is um, at least for our purposes nowadays uh, natural, and the amount of material from the Sahara that uh, feeds into the Amazon uh, is like huge and and super ma important. So we don't necessarily want to eliminate the Sahara, but managing to combat desertification on that scale is kind of mind blowing. Uh, so you know every effort that that uh, supports things like that i think will will make a huge impact so like yeah i just wanted to mention a few positive projects um anybody else got one yeah i think there's a bunch of uh agrivoltaics look really promising there seems to be a lot of investment in that because people in southern europe seem to be figuring out that they need to manage the humidity of their crops and it's useful for that yeah, uh, my, I have a side quest at the moment that is uh, around agrophotovoltaics uh, and specifically in the context of uh, developing countries. So one of the things that happens uh, for those not uh, super into power grids um, is uh, so <laughs> if you have countries with very underdeveloped power grids, the, the few locations where there is a power grid are typically close to the cities, and uh, the land immediately around the city is where you're going to have the most contention or most compet uh, competition for, for land, because that's the best way to import food into the city. And so what you want to do is uh, you need more electricity, but you can't take that uh, land away from the agricultural use. So by mixing those together, uh, building photovoltaics that are raised about four, four to six meters above the agricultural land, so you can still do farming underneath. Um, it, it reduces the heat stress on the plants. It, it reduces the evaporation of water, uh, while you know, and makes it possible to grow things that um, you might not be able to grow in a like much warmer environment. But uh, you know, it's not perfect, and we don't have good out, out, out of the box models for it yet. So. But yeah, it's it's super cool. Thanks for mentioning that. Huh? In I think they're starting to bring more of it in France. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm super excited about uh, meat replacements and uh, general uh, vegetarian-based uh, uh, options. Uh, one of the founders of the Vegetarian Butcher, Dutch company, uh, now started uh, Vegan Cowboys. And the, the company tries to create a yeast which can create milk directly from grass. So you just cut out the whole cow in between. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's super awesome. Uh, Compina, the Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, milk company said, oh, we're not afraid, but I think they're afraid. And <laughs> I hope they're afraid because uh, I, I love cows. Uh, I hope they can stay uh, on this planet even after the uh, dairy industry. 
but they're not as effi efficient in creating milk. Horses are still around, not yeah. as many as in the 19th century, but they're still around. Actually, there's more yeah. around in this country than ever before. <laughs> uh. Oh, yeah. There's a Canadian startup called uh, Carbocrete that sounds interesting. Um, they are working with the steel industry in Canada and capturing their waste CO2 and shoving it into concrete instead of sand. Um, it is producing net uh, negative carbon concrete. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, uh, I actually, so steel mills are a pet peeve of mine because they produce about 7% of all, all CO2 uh, that's released and nobody ever complains about them, you know, because nobody sees steel mills, they're just like, they, they're just there. But uh, yeah, no, that's, that's super cool. The, all the big steel producers are looking into hydrogen-based steel production for, because steel production ultimately is a redox reaction. You, have to, you want to pull out the oxygen that is inside uh, iron oxide, and currently you use syn gas for that, which you produce based on with coal, but you can't do it with hydrogen. Uh, there is a viable way forward to close to net zero steel in the reasonably near close future. Yeah. Oh, uh, and on that note, uh, the aluminum industry. Uh, so the way uh, aluminum is, uh, so you take a bauxite from the ground, you process it. It's actually a very horrible process that needs to be fixed uh, with that. It's uh, lots of lye, lots of uh, like uh, bad bases. But when you get the aluminum uh, or aluminum oxide uh, uh, powder, essentially, it needs to be. Uh, you need to remove the oxygen from it, and the way they do that is through electrolysis. And uh, so what has been done for pretty much, you know, the, since the whole Haro process was uh, created, is they use these uh, giant um, uh, carbon-based um, uh, electro uh, so electrodes, uh, and uh, the oxygen is being pulled to, to the carbon, and then that releases the CO2. So it's a very CO2-rich uh, um, uh, and, you know, bad process. So now uh, some people uh, in Iceland incidentally uh, have developed a, um, a new type of electrode for um, aluminum smelting that is uh, carbon neutral. So I don't know if they've gotten into production yet but the testing's uh, basically done. So that's positive. Uh, I think there are so many cool projects at the moment um, and Two or three months ago, I, uh, I saw that you can be a volunteer, uh, an NG coach um, within your uh, uh, city. So what you do, you, you get a, uh, they, they teach you first what you should do as a, as a coach, and then you go to people and then educate them. Like, let's say, uh, turn out off the lights if you go, uh, go away. Uh, but they also help you to find which areas in your house are uh, is wind coming through? So I think that's it's not really cool, but it will help. Mm -hmm. So you go to people, you make them aware, and they they start thinking about okay, if I if I be if I use smart small uh, initiatives or or uh, steps, it can save me money, um, and maybe it will turn out that they. Uh, to become, I say, they they also provide us ideas back yeah. about about sustainability. Yeah, cool. So I think we're maybe done. Are we? That's amazing. As uh, you know, I mean, okay, it's been a you know, we've, we've it's been a rough session. We've uh, we've uh, had to go through a lot of stuff, right? But we came into this with, okay, what are the conditions needed for everything to be, be absolutely terrible? And now we're kind of at a point where, like, we know what to do. We, we need to care more. We need to learn more. We need to have better, make better decisions. This is fantastic, right? Um, we've heard about some cool projects. We know that there are many more cool projects out there. And I think, you know, if we go through the points here, 
we want to improve the incentives, but you know, we need to have these conversations. We need to experience connectedness and you know and train each other. You know, to your last point, uh, we need to like uh, understand the life cycles of our things. We need to improve learning and research and uh, and awareness around that. Introduce more systems thinking into the entire process. Think in longer term uh, as much as possible, and then. On the policy side, or you know, making decisions, internalize the externalities. I think we came back to that point about 15 times, and like you know, if we'd come back to it 1,500 more times, it wouldn't have been less true. So um, you know, we do have some some weeds here. You know, uh, beat industry, the aviation industry is not perfect. Uh, shipping, you know, la la la. Uh, definitely need to fix monocultures, but we still like being able to get avocados in the in the polar regions, right? Um, you know, but I love this one. Protect the poor. Like you know, being being a little bit humane about the fact that there's a lot of countries where uh, people are still struggling with the basic necessities of life, and just being you know, uh, making sure that they don't get fucked over by us being uh, trying to save the planet. Because if we save the planet but fuck them over in the process, then you know they might be incentivized to fuck us over next time, and you know it'll be it'll be nasty. So let's protect everybody. Uh, reform land and stop planned obsolescence and 15 million other things that we might be able to do to improve our lives. But you know what? I'm pretty hopeful. We're not. It's not perfect. It's going to be hard, but we'll win. Okay. You want a final I point? Have a for you. Okay. You, bri you briefly said you're a recovering anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> can you yeah, talk to it's take a? a but it's oh, okay. Can you can you talk about it? anarchist in, in public because it uh, it confuses people a lot um, the but generally if I, if I must label myself with some kind of uh, political label I would say uh, mutualist so um, like uh, I believe in free markets and, and networks of, of exchange and, and that kind of thing um, you know but I also wanted to be voluntary and non coercive and uh, on a uh, individual communal basis. So, you know, um, and I actually, so the book that um, that Ella was uh, uh, talking about yesterday, um, uh, the dawn of everything. Um, I think that the ideas that are presented in there about like a non-coercive society, uh, they fit very nicely with that kind of um, you know, like mutualist uh, political economy and and things like that. But yeah. This is off topic, so maybe we can talk about it over a beer later. Uh, but does that answer your question? Uh, I don't okay, okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, regardless of what our politics are or where we come from, I, I, you know, does everybody roughly agree that we've made some progress in the direction of being hopeful? Okay, perfect. And my job here is done. Thank you very much. See you at the bar.